Praxis Prepper. Hey everybody, this is Praxis Prepper, and in this video, uh, this is our third in a series with Andre Pogar uh, with his book, uh, The Age of Anomaly, which I finally remembered without having to refer to my notes. Uh, he's been generous enough to sit with us for four videos to go over some of the topics in his book about economic collapse, which is something that I think a lot of people feel is kind of beyond them. It's, it's difficult to understand, but Andre really uh, talks about it in his book in a way that I think makes it really accessible. In the first video, we talked about sort of how we got to this point, what are some of the factors that led to people feeling the sense of angst and anxiety about you know our system in the second video we talked about what keeps Andre up at night you know what is sort of his his big fear about uh, you know what he's nervous about uh, and in this video what we want to talk about is sort of the when about that because uh, you know economic cycles they go up they go down it's pretty predictable that there's always going to be an up and there's always going to be a down but the idea of predicting when that down is going to be and you know to some degree how severe it's going to be can be very helpful for people that might want to you know if you want to use a car crash analogy step out of the way of the speeding vehicle before it, it strikes you you know just get out of the road now you know there's a car coming down the road so uh, that's what we're going to talk about today and again Andre has been good enough to sit with us here today thank you very much Andre and uh, Let's go over and just try to convey to people uh, what what are the things they could be looking for, what are the canaries in the coal mine, what are, what are warning signs, flags that they can watch out for that will make them feel like they're not like just jumping out of a burning building before anybody's even lit a match. I know, you know we're talking about the, burning, the buildings kind of already smoldering, but you know what I'm talking about, the idea of having a sense of when things are really going to maybe start happening as opposed to just like, well, we know this is going to happen someday, but we don't know exactly when. What are those warning signs? In my book, I try to continuously push the idea that there are two dimensions to this. On the one hand, maximizing the likelihood that you're going to be able to spot the next financial crisis as early on as possible. And on the other hand, there's also the idea of having the humility it takes to realize that in my case, even someone like me who thinks about these things day in and day out, the next crash might take me by surprise as well, and it's something we need to accept right off the bat. Moving back to the first dimension, in my opinion, it's all a matter of properly keeping your ear to the ground. In my book, of course, I give the example that many like to refer to with canaries in the coal mine. I like to tell people to have as many canaries as possible with them so that they receive warning signals ahead of time. And what this essentially means, especially in the crazy world from a media perspective that we live in today, where everyone's just wrapped in his or her own little bubble, what this means, what having canaries on you means in the context of our conversation is being willing to be exposed to various viewpoints. I push this idea tremendously. If way too many people are caught up in just their own little ideological bubbles, like uh, if you're a Republican, you're only going to watch Republican news sources. If you're a Democrat, you're only going to watch Democrat news sources. If you're a libertarian, then again, you're going to be wrapped up in that particular bubble and the list could go on and on. What I tell people is that the most important thing in this entire equation is thinking for yourself. And it's not pretty, it's not pleasant, especially since when you expose yourself to different ideologies, ways of thinking, it's gonna, it's gonna affect you in all the wrong ways initially, but in the long run, it's going to enable you to nurture the various canaries you need to have with you. And right off the bat, the healthiest principle, as you guys know, is that it's better to prepare too soon, even a year, two years too soon, than a week too late. And in my book, I do address the idea of false positives. If you are afraid of ridicule, if you're afraid that, oh, what if I prepare too early and people are going to laugh at me, then you're playing this in the, the wrong, you know, it, it's just ridiculous how wrong you are. Unfortunately, the stakes here are so high and this is such an asymmetric opportunity. In other words, there's so much value associated in the idea of being prepared and not losing everything, which make no mistake is what is gonna happen to most people. It's what traders consider an asymmetrical opportunity. In other words, something you do, but that has 
potentially, you know, outrageous, uh, outrageously high potential benefits. And yeah, do you risk ridicule for preparing early on? Yes. Do I risk ridicule for, you know, spending so much time being all over YouTube, spreading this particular message, telling people about my book? Most definitely. But it's just something you have to accept. It's just something you have to accept. You're gonna deal with many false positives. It comes with the territory and it's, it's perhaps one of the main mistakes people make when it comes to investing, when it comes to the financial dimension of their life. They're like, okay, I have prepared for this outcome, I have prepared for that outcome, but look, none of them materialized. Maybe I told a few friends and family members and they made fun of me or they thought, yeah, what is it with this chicken little guy? And then, due to this state of affairs, you become discouraged. You, you take your eyes off the prize and you start to doubt the strategy you spent so much time putting together. Again, guys, it's you don't need impeccable timing. I promise you that you don't. You don't need to make it your life's mission to, to, to worry about these things that are related to our financial world. No. You just need to keep your ear to the ground. You need to follow, you know, economists across the entire spectrum. You need to keep your eyes open as to what's happening. I don't know, maybe down in Italy, for example, uh, with the potential banking crisis that might be looming in countries like Italy. And, and, and basically, if you just spend a little bit of time nurturing those canaries, you know, your European canary, your American canary, your Chinese canary, because we, leave, we, because we live in such a deeply interconnected world. And when someone sneezes in China, you're gonna catch a cold. And this is all it boils down to it, basically. Covering your bases, taking good care of your canaries and not feeling, I don't know, not feeling that you're on the wrong side of this, not feeling that you're making a mistake just because this or that canary gave you a false positive. I think that when it comes to maximizing the likelihood of spotting a financial storm early on, this is all you need to do. So it sounds like what you would recommend is go uh, to sources that you would feel would be reliable, that would give you good information. It sounds like uh, maybe you might agree with the idea that just going out and looking randomly at news stories is sort of like amateur day trading, that it's really hard to kind of get a full picture from that, so that you would suggest you know, going to you know, economist sources, various news outlets. Would you, would you agree that that's sort of what you're suggesting people might do? Definitely. And as a general rule of thumb, if an idea you're being exposed to makes your blood boil, then it means you're doing something right. It means you're working on your mental elasticity. It means you're becoming more open-minded. And as time passes, you're gonna become more and more numb to things that used to make you ridiculously angry. Because yes, this is what it boils down to. The stakes are too high for you to feel that you have to take a team, you have to pick a team. You don't. Expose yourself and I mean willfully, make it a goal to expose yourself to as many opinions as possible and gather your information from as many sources as possible because at the end of the day, it's on you. It's on you to question everything. It's on you to gather information and especially, guys, this is not something you should outsource. It's on you to make the final decision. I think that's great advice for people and that's something I promote a lot of times on my channel as well, the idea of, uh, you exposing yourself to information that is you know uncomfortable to you that, cha that challenges you I know when I go out and I get my news I have various websites where I go to usually and you know half of them you know, are demonizing you know anybody who's on the left of the spectrum and the other half that I look to are demonizing anyone on the right in the spectrum then I have, I have you know more centrist uh, uh, you know websites that I look at but I think it's really important to just get yourself out there and exposed to lots of different perspectives and you know not all of it's going to resonate with you right away but I think there's always well there's very frequently something to everything that you find out there I mean you know there's just garbage out there as well but uh, I think that's great advice for anybody would you have uh, w I don't know if you'd be willing to share some of the, the you know the news sources that you, that you have found that you can rely on I don't know if you want to name exact places this is something that a lot of people are a little unfamiliar with maybe they, they don't know the difference between a place that is offering well, I, I know for uh, economic uh, news, uh, there's one website that I go to, and I think that they get a financial amount of their revenue from 
advertisers who are trying to sell precious metals and gold because they have a lot of scare stories on there where you know I'm I'm thinking you know I think this was written by someone who's you know in the markets <laughs> you know selling precious metals uh, so sometimes it's difficult to tell the difference between true news and something that is kind of like propaganda trying to get you to do something like buy precious metals from them so w would you share some of uh, you know your news sources that you feel are a little bit more trustworthy it doesn't have to be all of them but some some place for as a starting point for people well, first and foremost, I think the number one thing you should do is abandon the quest of finding the perfect news source. Because as you've pointed out, there are going to be conflicts of interest absolutely everywhere. And that's, you know, that is just how things stand. You've mentioned, you know, uh, gold related, you know, websites frequently uh, with uh, opinion formers who are on the Austrian economics end of it. I don't know, you have your Peter Schiff, you have your Mike Maloney. And of course, those people have every incentive in the world to push gold related projects. But does it make their research any less relevant? No, it's not. So essentially, whenever you're, you're following a certain news source, then it's on you to just eliminate the noise and focus on the meaningful part of it. So yes, I believe there's tons of value in following people who are on the Austrian economic side of things. Even if you're not an Austrian, then you have individuals who, you know, are, are very flexible, who have a very firm grasp of economic history. You have your Martin Armstrong, for example. And of course, Martin Armstrong also pushes his conferences. He pushes Socrates. His, he pushes his own projects as well. But does it make, for example, his historic perspective, does it make it any less valid? No, it doesn't. On the other hand, you also have your diehard Keynesians. Guys, in all honesty, I follow uh, Krugman's work on New York Times, I, follow, I read Stiglitz, I, I follow Keynesians as well. And I'm a person, I study economic systems, I'm not allowed to be an Austrian economist, I'm not allowed, at least I don't allow myself to be a Keynesian, Austrian, I, I'm in it for the research, I'm in it for the science, and it's precisely a guy like me who studies economic systems who cannot allow himself to be biased. So again, do I take information from, from them as well? Absolutely. Do I even take information from those ridiculous, from those, those ridiculous, you know, shows on CNBC, you know, their money related content and whatnot and Bloomberg and whatever? Yes, I do. I find them excellent at figuring out how things stand when it comes to market sentiment. And, and as you guys have managed to realize by now, each, each content source is basically a piece of the puzzle. Is it difficult sometimes to filter out the noise and just be left with the meaningful part of the message? Yes. But once again, when the potential reward is so asymmetrically high, we're talking about the idea of saving your family, we're talking about the idea of landing on your feet when everyone else, make no mistake, is going to suffer. When the rewards are so asymmetrically high, putting in the work makes perfect sense. And I promise you, it sounds complicated, but at the end of the day, it's all a matter of embracing a few sim uh, core principles and putting together a sustainable strategy when it comes to media consumption. It's really not rocket science. Thank you, and thank you for calling me out on my logical fallacy with uh, uh, you know, associating you know, the, the message deliverer with the quality of the message. That is true. You can have someone with uh, you know, mixed interests, and that doesn't necessarily you know, mean that what they're saying isn't relevant. And that's why I think it's important, uh, like you said, to get a very broad perspective on things because you can start seeing where the common threads are between all of them. So in the next video, what we want to talk about, because uh, this is something that we are, um, uh, you know, trying to actually address for people, is the idea of how to uh, increase our sense of general resiliency. Because uh, if it, it is difficult to time these things, it's difficult to know exactly when that wall is coming down the road. It, you, know, you can pay attention to news sources, but why not be prepared all the time? And being generally financially resilient is a great uh, message that's in Andre's book. We're going to talk about that in the next video, about things that you can do to kind of bulletproof, well, 
I, I don't know if bulletproof is the right word, but uh, you know, give you yourself some protection from from you know a broad range of different uh, threats and things that are going to just going to be benefit your general life, you know, independent of whether there ever is a crash, which there almost certainly will be. <laughs> so we'll talk about that in the next video. Thanks for watching. Please subscribe and tune in every Friday at 4.30 New York time for a new video. And if you'd like to support this channel, you can do so both through Patreon or PayPal.